Now, I'm going to preach on the Galatians text, but I want to make one note on the text that you just heard, um, which is when you hear those disciples, potential disciples coming up to Jesus and Jesus' response to them, remember that we don't know what happened next with any of those three disciples. We don't know whether they heard Jesus' challenges and responded positively and continued to follow, or if they heard Jesus' challenges and felt like that was too much of a challenge and walked away. So as you hear those texts, I know those texts sound a little hard, what Jesus is saying, but we also don't know what happened next in those stories and to wonder about how these disciples heard those conversations and how they responded. Anyway, at my last congregation, we had a new family attending worship. And this family was a split home, and so their attendance, attendance was inconsistent because they were split between us and another church that they were going to. This family also had multiple children, and so they needed a lot of space. And as a result, they didn't really have a set pew like some people. Like, I always know, you guys are going to be right here, and you're going to be right behind them, right? Like, this is where you guys sit. But this family, they didn't have one of those set pews because they needed a lot of space. And so they sat wherever there was enough space for them to sit. And honestly, they sat wherever the kids pick. And a different kid got to pick where to sit every single time they have visited. You never knew if they'd be up front or in the middle or in the back or sometimes in the balcony. But it was always a joy to have them there. One Sunday, they sat in a pew that was someone else's regular spot. Oh, oh, see, you know. Okay, gotcha. Now, I'm so much of a social butterfly, and I've moved around so much in my own life that I've never really understood why a certain seat is important. But you all get it, so I, I trust you'll understand this story. When the person who regularly sat there came in, they got upset. You're it sitting in my spot. And the parent sitting there replied with something like, I just got my family sat down. We are not moving. <laughs> the person who regularly sits there did not like that answer and decided that it was their spot whether or not the family moved. And so they proceeded to enter the pew and attempted to sit down on top of the parent. I was not in the sanctuary at the time when this was happening. I did not see it happen. It was a month or so later before I heard this story. I called the parent up and said, I haven't seen your family in worship recently. Is everything okay? And that's when they share with me the story and told me that they would no longer be worshiping at my congregation. Now, I know the story kind of sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But it's not so much different from stories like pushing your way in front of another vehicle when you're on the road to get ahead of them, or running to get ahead of someone in the checkout line, or budging so you're not the last person, or sending in 400 complaints to the city of Wauwatosa because the panhandlers make you feel uncomfortable, or taking a seat in the emergency row exit on the airplane so you can be comfortable while the tall person with the long legs must try to cram into one of those small, normal seats. Like every not-in-my-backyard argument, every moment where we say, I'm more important than you. As I looked at this list, these two lists that Paul lifted up in the Galatians reading, I struggled how to make sense of the vices he was listing. I mean, he mentioned drunkenness. But a number of us in this room drink. Jesus made wine he made, and he made wine at a party where everyone was already clearly drunk. And he made a lot of wine. How do we make sense of Paul listing drunkenness as one of those things that's an obvious sin of the flesh when we see what Jesus did? Or the next one, carousing. Our celeb most celebrated movies shows sailors carousing before they go off to war. That's joy and merrymaking. It, you know, obviously Paul's list, it's neither exhaustive, but it's not been meant to be taken so seriously that we're going to reenact prohibition either. And so I wondered, how do we make sense of this list? What is he trying to get at? And as I looked at the list, I got to thinking of Luther's definition of sin. Martin Luther, 
He, his favorite way of describing sin was self curved in on self. He called it navel gazing. Doing everything with only me in mind. And Luther wrote this while he was a father who noticed his babies who, you know, started in the field position were always only worried about themselves, right? A loving father who looked at his kids and realized the first words out of his babes was mine. <laughs> right? Mine. You know that word? Whose doll is this? Mine. Well, whose TV is this? Mine. Whose $30,000 car is this? Mine. Right? And then there's that one phrase that children learn really early as well, my turn. I come across this one so much. I'm doing something fun with one child. I just started doing something fun of them. And if another child sees, you are guaranteed that that other child is not going to consider for a minute how long the first child has been doing whatever the activity is or whether or not um, they should be doing it longer. They are going to scream, my turn, my turn, my turn, until they get their way, right? What are the fruits of only worrying about me? of what I want, what my family needs, what's good for my neighborhood. You know this from kids as well. If you tell them, not yours, what happens? They cry. If you tell them, wait, no more, they scream. The fruits of only worrying about me, only worrying about how my child is treated at school, the rush that I'm in, and that I, for the first time ever, can't find all the food that I want at the grocery store. That's the list of the things Paul is describing. The fruits of those concerns. It's all about me. Now, I'm not saying that it is inappropriate for you to think about yourself. When the neighbor puts up a 10-foot fence on your property line, you're going to have feelings and opinions, and you are right to respond. Because, I mean, well, first of all, the neighbor just did exactly what we just described, right? Only thinking about themselves. But what happens if you repeat that same pattern and do the same thing they just did and only think about yourself? What's that relationship going to look like when they're only thinking about themselves and you're only thinking about yourselves and there is this 10-foot wall between the two of you? Huh? You know how this works. How fast will you and your neighbor bear those fruits of the flesh that Paul listed How does Paul put it? If you bite and devour one another, be careful. Go down that path, and you just might be consumed by each other. But how are we to do any different? When half of our neighbors are cheering at the recent Supreme Court decision and half of our neighbors are mourning it, how are we to do any different? When half of our neighbors are afraid that their guns are going to be taken away and the other half of our neighbors are afraid they're going to be shot, How are we to do any different? When my neighbor does something that I don't like, how am I to respond any differently? If Jesus had been like us, he would have stormed Jerusalem, raised an army, and sacked Rome or died trying. But instead of throwing our sin back in our faces, like one might do when the neighbor builds a 10-foot fence, Scripture says that Jesus took our sins onto himself. Think about that. I know sometimes this language of bearing our sins seems a little odd today, but what is the opposite of throwing people's sins back in their faces? What is the opposite of Paul's list of quarrels and factions of strife and anger, fighting and violence? Instead of waging war, Jesus laid down his life. Instead of conquering the world, Jesus loved the world, even those who hated him. That doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't passionate about the truth, but that he was also passionate about his neighbors, about us. One of the truths I've learned in history is that you only know that it's only by being loved that we are able to learn how to love. I've seen this plenty of times again and again. In the desperately needy, it's only when they are loved that they finally figure out how to love. 
in bullies. It's only when they are loved that they figure out how to love. In the stuck up, it's only, it's only when the stuck up, you, know, you imagine these lists I'm making here, people are like hard to love, right? But it's only when they're loved that they learn how to love. In babies, I mean, first of all, it's only when they're loved that they even live. But it's only when they are loved that they learn how to love. And it's through Jesus' unequivocal love that we now have love. Paul calls it the spirit of God's son, and he says, you have the spirit of God's son in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And what does this love look like? Luther called sin self-curved in on self. Jesus' love is self-curved out toward neighbor. Peace is the fruit of engaging in a relationship of love with someone else. Patience comes from working together in hope, having to bear with you when we don't quite have it figured out. Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, especially self-control. These are the fruits of seeking relationships of love with our neighbor. And joy. Joy is the fruit of finally having a relationship of love with our neighbor. How do you joyfully grow disciples in Christ? You show them God's love, share the spirit of God's son that lives in your heart with them until the doors of their heart open up and they find that same spirit living in them as well. This is exactly how God loves us. These fruits that Paul lists, when you think about God's love, God is faithful, right? Giving us promises that we can trust. <clears throat> God is generous, pouring down grace on the good and the bad alike, Jesus says. God expresses self-control, or as the Old Testament put it, God is slow to anger. God is patient, withholding judgment for our failures. God is kind, giving grace where judgment's deserved. God gives peace that the world cannot give, Jesus says. God is love, Paul says. God is love and God loves the world. And most of all, God's joy is being in relationship with us. God's happiness, God's joy comes from loving this world and saying that you are mine and I love you and I will always be for you. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Not because they're what we're supposed to do or something, but because this is who God is for us. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there are no rules. And Paul says to you, live. Live by the spirit, for this is our promise. The spirit of Christ is with you all. Amen.